For 20 long years, it's changed China in unexpected ways. What is the true impact of the Chinese Communist Party's crackdown on Falun Gong? Welcome back to China Uncensored. I'm Chris Chappell. July 20th, 2019 will mark the 20th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party's brutal and deadly persecution of Falun Gong. And if you're shopping for a gift, the traditional 20th anniversary present is China, which is perfect because the Communist Party has just about broken their China. In 1999, the Communist Party declared it illegal to practice Falun Gong. Falun Gong is a spiritual discipline that draws on traditional Chinese values and teaches people to be tolerant, honest, and compassionate. But if you're a certain type of Chinese leader, you see everything as a threat to your power, even compassion, especially compassion. That's why in the 1990s, Chinese leader and hypnoto Jiang Zemin set in motion a terrifying campaign of persecution that has directly victimized tens of millions of Falun Gong practitioners in China. That campaign includes mass incarceration without trial, torture, and state-sanctioned killing. But even for people who don't practice Falun Gong, or don't particularly care about Falun Gong, or can't imagine why someone would just sit there with their eyes closed for like two hours, the persecution of Falun Gong matters. Over the last 20 years, it's had a profound impact on many other things in China, from the way policing is done, to how other citizens are treated under the law, to the mass surveillance and labor camp system. It indirectly affects all people in China. So to really understand what China is like today under Communist Party rule, you need to understand what they did to Falun Gong. That's why in today's episode, we look at five ways the persecution of Falun Gong changed China for the worse. Number five, strengthening the tools of repression. You know, it's not easy persecuting a hundred million people. To carry it out, Jiang Zemin had to drastically beef up China's domestic security apparatus. In addition to the normal police force, he set up a Gestapo-like secret police called the 610 Office. According to the Congressional Executive Commission on China, the 610 Office was charged with the mission of enforcing a ban on Falun Gong and carrying out a crackdown against its practitioners. The 610 Office did everything. From the boring things like mass surveillance to the exciting things like rounding up elderly people and torturing them to death in re-education camps. That's a job where you really don't want to bring your work home with you. And the budget for these actions grew and grew. Along with the 610 office, the Communist Party also expanded the police and other types of internal security. After all, it takes a lot of teamwork to crush the spirit of the people. From almost nothing in the 1990s, by 2017, the Chinese regime was spending $180 billion on internal security, which is a lot, especially considering they only spent $152 billion on external defense, including the army, navy, etc. It's almost as if the party thinks the real enemy isn't the United States, but a billion angry Chinese citizens. But the party didn't just expand domestic security. No, if you're going to persecute 100 million people, all of the worst parts of the Communist Party system need to be involved. Uh, the persecution against Falun Gong had a profound effect on, on the party apparatus. Um, it, it really strengthened the parts of the party apparatus that were more aggressive, more repressive. Uh, you know, it, it expanded the labor camp system. It created more pressure on judges from party committees behind the scenes. It strengthened the propaganda dimensions of Chinese state media. Uh, and it gave uh, a set of resources and money to, again, the most repressive parts of the party apparatus. And this was at a time that a lot of people thought that maybe the, the party was shifting gears, that, that there was a loosening, there was talk about closing the labor camp system and things like that. And um, the start launching the campaign against Falun Gong really reversed that. The 610 office was technically disbanded last year, but that doesn't mean it's over. The 610 office's functions were merged into other domestic security forces, including ones now used in Tibet and Xinjiang, bringing their years of expertise to persecuting even more people. Number four, fueling an ongoing power struggle. You may recall that in 2018, the National People's Congress removed the two-term limit for the presidency, effectively allowing Xi Jinping to remain president for life. Or as I call him, presidator because he's not quite a president, but not quite a dictator. 
Instead, he's the best of both worlds. According to the BBC, now she has amassed power the likes of which has not been seen since Chairman Mao Zedong. But Xi's dictatorial maneuverings have their roots partly in the persecution of Falun Gong. That's because the President for Life ploy is tied to the power struggle between Xi Jinping and former leader Jiang Zemin, the one who really hates Falun Gong. Jiang had formally relinquished all his titles by 2005, but he's remained at the helm of the so-called Shanghai clique. That's one of the two major competing factions within the Chinese Communist Party, the other being Xi Jinping's faction. Jiang was initially a weak leader. He amassed power through the party apparatuses he built up through persecuting Falun Gong. Then he promoted all his cronies to run them, so his people were in charge of the military, domestic security, propaganda, and more. Even when Jiang retired, his successor, Hu Jintao, was almost powerless, which is why he always looked like this. But when Xi Jinping came around, Jiang's people weren't happy. They don't dare let all their crimes come to light. Torture, murder, and worse. Yes, it gets worse. So their struggle against Xi Jinping is aimed at protecting that. Since taking office in 2012, Xi Jinping has been engaging in a life and death contest with Jiang Zemin's influential political faction. Part of that contest were Xi's so-called revenge purges, also known as his anti-corruption campaign. These involved taking charge of the military, disbanding the 610 office, and arresting Jiang Zemin's closest associates and locking them up for a long time. But to do those things, Xi Jinping had to first amass power for himself. That's the only way to undo Jiang's death grip on the system. Or maybe he would have done it anyway. President for Life does have a nice ring to it. Number three, setting the stage persecuting Uyghurs. The persecution of Falun Gong primed the Chinese regime for its persecution of the Uyghurs in China's western Xinjiang region. Not to say that the Uyghurs weren't targeted before, but after 20 years experience going after Falun Gong, mass surveillance, locking people up, throwing them in political re-education camps, the Communist Party got really good at persecuting people. Practice makes perfect. The UN estimates that around one million Muslims have been detained in re-education camps in Xinjiang. The anti-Falun Gong crackdown may have very well been the training model for what is now taking place in Xinjiang, where the party has designated the practice of Islam by Uyghurs as an extremist threat to the regime that must be extinguished by the forcible reform of the thinking of each individual Uyghur. Falun Gong's belief system, of course, is completely different from Islam, but the Communist Party's solution is the same. Torture and brainwash people until they see how great the Communist Party is. The persecution against Falun Gong is two-pronged. First, vilify the practice ideologically, then destroy its practitioners physically. That's exactly the same pattern taking place in Xinjiang right now. The legitimacy of their beliefs are both ridiculed and denigrated, and the population is attacked as a dangerous threat to society in need of harsh reform. And not only are the methods the same, some of the same party officials are in charge. And the fact that they have 20 years of experience helps explain how they have managed to launch and implement such a massive campaign within such a short time frame. Gotta learn from the best at being the worst. Number two, starting a global hacking campaign. China's state-backed hacking of other countries' cyber infrastructure is a well-documented threat. As evidenced by this investigation, the threats we face have never been more severe or more pervasive or more potentially damaging to our national security. And no country poses a broader, more severe, long-term threat to our nation's economy and cyber infrastructure than China. But what's less well known is that China's hacking program got off the ground targeting overseas Falun Gong websites. See, one of the challenges with persecuting millions of innocent people is that you also have to keep them quiet. But Falun Gong practitioners in the US, Canada, and other free countries began to set up websites like Minghui.org. They publicly exposed as much of the torture and killing as they could document. It was a serious PR problem for the Communist Party. And according to this report by the RAND Corporation, when the Communist Party started going after Falun Gong in 1999, and Falun Gong practitioners tried to peacefully appeal, the party attacked pro-Falun Gong websites around the world. 
Party bosses responded by ordering the arrest and prosecution of Falun Gong leaders and members and the blocking of access to the group's international constellation of websites. Think about it. If you're trying to slander a group through lies and propaganda, and that group publishes information that tears apart your lies, you really have no choice but to silence them. The RAND report documents a whole bunch of these cyber attacks in the early years of the persecution. Attacks that were directly traced back to the address of the Public Security Bureau in Beijing. Fast forward a few years, and thanks to all those years of practice hacking dissidents, China's hackers have been able to take the training wheels off. Now, they're pulling off mass-scale espionage attacks on global cellular networks. Chinese hackers hit 27 universities to steal military secrets. And Chinese hackers even hacked the NSA and stole their hacking tools, and used them for more hacking. And finally, number one, killing people for their organs. The Chinese Communist Party's persecution of Falun Gong made widespread the heinous practice of killing prisoners of conscience for their organs. Recently, an international tribunal found there was clear evidence that it's been taking place for decades. We, the tribunal members, are all certain, unanimously and sure beyond reasonable doubt, that in China, forced organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience has been practiced for a substantial period of time involving a very substantial number of victims. Falun Gong practitioners are not the first victims of forced organ harvesting, but they are probably the principal source. Over the last 20 years, millions of Falun Gong practitioners in the vast network of detention centers across China have served as a kind of living storage bank for organs. And that's allowed Chinese state-run hospitals to improve their transplant skills and technology. Currently, an estimated 60,000 or more illegal organ transplants are carried out each year. I mean, sometimes rich party cadres just need a new heart, or liver, or kidneys. And with forced organ harvesting, the persecution of Falun Gong seems to be a blueprint for the treatment of other dissidents. When you look at what's happening in Xinjiang, on that background and some of the circumstances, it's really scary. Uh, it's really scary because they've got the massive bio data. Basically what they do in China is they reverse match organ transplants. People get transplants within a week, within a month. They reverse match them to people in custody or who they otherwise have access to. So those are just some of the ways that the Chinese Communist Party's persecution of Falun Gong has changed China over the last 20 years, which makes it incredible that so few people pay attention to it. I mean, I get it. 20 years is a long time. 20 years ago, there was no YouTube. 20 years ago, you could rent The Matrix on a VHS tape from Blockbuster Video. Hold on, my youth is flashing before my eyes. The point is, whether it's the persecution of the Uyghurs or Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign, or a whole slew of other things, there's a lot that's happening in China right now that you can't really understand if you don't look at the Communist Party's treatment of Falun Gong. And it may have started 20 years ago, but it's still going on now. So, what do you think about all the ways the persecution of Falun Gong has changed China? Leave your comments below. And now, it's time for me to answer a question from you, one of the loyal members of my 50-cent army. Cell asks, at what point would the U.S. slash U.N. get involved to help protect the one-party, two systems? With the tensions surrounding the trade war in North Korea, what responses could be on the table if China continues to press the issue? Good question, Sel. At what point would the U.S. or U.N. get involved if the Chinese Communist Party erodes Hong Kong's one country, two systems? The sad answer is, at no point. Since Hong Kong is officially part of the People's Republic of China, that makes it China's internal affair. There's nothing the United Nations can do, especially since China sits on the UN Security Council and can veto pretty much anything. Likewise, the US would not go to war to protect Hong Kong, since the US has no defense treaty with Hong Kong. Hong Kong's best foreign ally should be the UK, since the UK signed the Sino-British Joint Declaration, which is an official treaty, except, the UK has shown it won't do anything beyond issuing toothless statements condemning the erosion of freedoms, yada, yada, yada. The best hope for Hong Kong is the people of Hong Kong. And boy, do they know how to protest. Thanks for your question, Sel. 
and you too can have your question answered on China Uncensored. Sign up on patreon.com slash China Uncensored and pledge to support us with a dollar or more per episode. Most of our revenue comes from this direct support through Patreon. Without it, we couldn't keep doing the show. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time.